Okay. So um, in the recording, for anybody who's here, all the um, chat names and things like that will be anonymous in the version that's recorded if we do if we put it up on the website. So it, you shouldn't be too you shouldn't be worried that, about uh, anonymity and things like that. So sorry, thank you um, for coming along to the first technical forum. And uh, what I'd like to do, the format, is just do a short presentation. I'm going to do a short presentation on some bits and pieces that we've learned on Archer in the early period that might be of use to people. And this is sort of a very a more technical focus. And then there's uh, a chance for people to ask, ask questions, um, have a, um, just ask anything they want to ask. Uh, we've got representatives here from, um, from Cray, from um, the CSE team here at EPCC, and also from the service provision team at EPCC, the people who look after the machine itself, the hardware, the people who look after the help desk, and general uh, provision for um, administration and things like that. So hopefully you can all see my slides. Uh, I had them all put earlier. I've sort of checked that um, the connection looks okay. So these are just a few tips and tricks. Right? So it's a random select or semi-random selection of uh, things that you might find useful in the system. Hopefully it won't take too long. I don't want to take over these time with people on technical talk. So what I'm going to talk about is using um, Intel's Math Kernel Library because that's it non obvious um, from the documentation at the moment of how to use it. Um, and a few words about the impact of hyper threading, and um, these are the hardware threads, where they, I don't know if you know what they are or not, but the hardware threads provided by the Intel processors. Uh, and a bit about how you can display the process and task placements um, for your job so you can find out which processors particularly you're tied to on which nodes. Uh, which, so that would be very useful, for, particularly for hybrid jobs and when you're underpopulating those, so you can comment about what you're doing, what you think you're doing. Um, let's talk about hardware characters and performance analysis a bit um, for the chance to assess how you're using memory and the processors. Uh, and then a couple of words on debugging um, tips and a few tips there. So the first thing I have is Intel MKL. So Intel, the MKL can be used Essentially, on the system as an alternative to uh, libsite for things like uh, BLAS, LAPAC, SkillAPAC, um, some FFT routines, things like that. Now, whereas libsite is very easy um, to include in your code, in fact, it's included by default in the way the system is set up, um, linking in MKL is a bit more uh, challenging, so I thought I'd just give a quick overview here. So, in terms of the system, which one gives better performance? The answer is actually it's complicated and it depends on your code. It's probably not the answer people want to hear, but um, that's the way it is. It's worth testing with MKR and with LibSide to see if either of them show improvements. I mean, generally, what we've seen when testing is that if the, different, the differences tend to be quite small because they're both very optimized libraries. Obviously, if you keep optimizing two libraries, even if they start from the same source, you're going to end up in the same place eventually. Uh, but for particular size, there's a problem. Um, particular routines, you might find that one is slightly faster than the other, or the other maybe 10% or so, on either way, um, generally is the maximum to. Um, they're not interface through modules, so you can't just load um, an MKL module to load it, but you can use these uh, linked lines here. I've got um, hydrogen green. So I haven't got the slides up in advance of the forum just because it's the first one and it's been a little bit rushed, but I will make the slides available on the website. Um, on the forum, um, on the forum website, just uh, linked into today's uh, instance, so you'll be able to download the slides and you can't read them uh, very well through the uh, projection through uh, confluence through the uh, collaborate site. So there are two links. Uh, it depends. You can link through from the GNU compiler and through the Intel compiler. Um, there are some great people in the room. I don't know if you can link. By the Cray compiler or not. I meant to ask that beforehand and didn't quite get around to it. So one of the Cray people would like to comment on the chat whether you can or not, that would be fine. Uh, that would be very useful. So you can see you have these re reasonably complex link lines which you just add to your code. And you have to make sure that they come before um, all the options that are linked automatically through modules. Um, if you want to find out how to do it yourself. There's something called the um, 
link line advisor, which is a it's sort of a web form that you can use on each other. So that's what's coming out. So we're currently collaborating, showing this one. Yeah, that's fine. That's right. Okay. So there's the link line advisor, um, which shows you. Um, how to, it gives you a, it's a web form, you fill in all the details and it provides you the link line at the end. Okay? So uh, if you want to use that, you can do. For Archer, you can see I've got a list of the options to select here at the bottom. Basically, you need Intel Composer, it's Linux, Intel 64, static linking, um, particular interface layer, maybe using the MPI version, um, a particular selection of MPH. And it should give you the right options uh, for including. On Archer. So um, please have a go with the uh, with NKL and see whether it improves your code. If you find that it does or it doesn't, if it's particularly good for city value, you want to share that information, please use the uh, technical form mailing list and share that with the community. You know, the, as much information as possible is more useful. Right? And the mailing list is archived on GIST mail, so it can be searched. And you can go and look back through it for a message you might have missed or you sort of half remember. So having information there is very useful uh, to the community in general, the Arch community in general. So if you discover anything interesting, please feel free to share it with everybody. So moving on from um, MKR, I'm positive, there's not much flow to this presentation. I'm just going to jump through a few topics that are of a particular I thought might be of interest to people. So the the impact of hyperthreads. So hyperthreads um, are two processes of threads from currently on a single physical core managed by um, in hardware. So the context switching is very fast compared to say a software uh, thread. Um, and the idea is that you can use um, the CPU resource even when one thread stops, say waiting for a memory access or something like that. So you try to get more efficient uh, use of the system. Whether these actually provide any benefit to you or not is very program dependent. Okay, because um, what you're actually doing, of course, is increasing the number of threads or processes that are competing for memory resource on the system. So depending on how your program and even interconnect resource, so depending on how your program uses memory and interconnect, you might actually be disadvantaging um, processes or threads in some way. Uh, but in some cases, uh, you can see a bit of speed up because it does this. Uh, it hides with memory latency and uses the thread, uses the cores a bit more efficiently. And on the plus side, if you see any improvement, even if it's on the order of very small improvement, two percent, five percent, something like that, you may as well use it because it's free. It's not actually charged by the node. So if you're getting a bit squeezing a bit of extra performance out of the node, um, then you're getting a bit more for your money. So it's worth having a look at. All you need to do actually is request nodes in the same way using the select statement that you're used to in your JavaScript, and then you have this uh, minus J2 options AP one. And that allows you to select select up to 48 cores on the node. In this case, in this example I've got here up to two nodes, one where you've got 48 cores on two nodes, giving a total of 96 uh, processes in this case, how you don't need for any software for any. Um, I sorry, I've stolen these slides from a uh, agent's talk on the intro course that's running in EPCC at the moment, so apologies agent I if, if you're listening, but I just stole one from you. But this is shows the impact of um, hyperthreading on a couple of programs um, tested on the Edison resource, which is a um, eight core Sandy Bridge. Um, of course, Arch is 12 core Sandy Bridge, so it's not entirely equivalent. And you can see for VAS, for example, um, it's slowed down the uh, code, so you wouldn't want to use it. For now, you can get a bit more at certain core counts. So depending on how you use um, your code and what core counts and the size of your problem, you can see um, improvements. So, so when so those comparisons in the, the blue ones are 48 MPI tasks per. By the way, because it's an eight core system. So so sorry, it'll be, it'll be whatever. So it'll be 16. Stick, oh, sorry, sorry, it'll be 8, 16, it'll be 32. 32 per node. Per node. And um, the red ones will be 64 MPI tasks per node. So it'll be double. Sorry, no, it'll be 16 and 32. Okay. So, but there will be double, twice many MPI tasks on a node. Yes, on a node. So, if you have, if you have the same size column, then your 
washing down the downstream. So if you only if you're if you're using a fixed number of MPI processes rather than a fixed number of nodes, you may find even though it runs a little longer because you're using less nodes in total, you can use number eight, so you might get charged less. Is that what you're getting at? Well, partly that, and also if you were to do the other way around, you would have the same type of problem, but you'd have smaller, you'd have smaller blocks for each decomposition, so yes. you could get some yes. slowdown because of communication costs. Yes, yes. Right. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, there's a lot of different things about this, and they can do it. Well, I think as well as the hyperthreading, as well as the hyperthreading, there's there's all the things about your how you parallel decompose, how you whether you're using fixed process accounts or whether you're buried the process accounts or using fixed node accounts. Um, but I think in all cases, the advice is test and see what happens. Okay. So there's not different from those what that text you can tap with. No, it's not clear. Whether it's no, I'd have to I'd have to go on a bit of look in a bit more depth because whether well, they just kept. Uh, the number of nodes fixed and the problem fixed, which is what you'd expect for a, for a yes. fair comparison in some senses. But you could imagine you even the MPI process is fixed. But, okay. Well, big because it's talking about the number of nodes on the x-axis, I suspect the first case is true. Yeah, there you go. So, Adrian's comment about 16 versus 22. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so the other useful thing, one of the other useful tricks, and this works on Hector as well, um, for people who are running on Hector as well, is a way to show which uh, particular cores and nodes your um, your processing threads are into. So although when you're just running fully packed, this isn't very interesting, you would think, because essentially you're just running on every core on every node that you've asked for. If you're running particularly a hybrid MPI open MP job or underpopulating a node, you might want to sort of think about the balance of running in different new regions, or if you're using hyperthread, the balance of which cores you're using in your hyperthreading, for example. So you have these two uh, environment variables at the top of your job submission script. Um, essentially, equals one just switches them on. It's all it does. That's a pretty standard thing. Then you get a lot more information. So you get two bits of information. The first one, the first one, the uh, CPU mass shows you which cores on the nodes you get to. The second one, the rank reorder display shows you which nodes your uh, processes are running on. The MPI processes. So what you get out um, is for the placements of the actual processes on the nodes, you get a list like this for every uh, PE you're running. So rank zero is on node X. In this case, um, I'm running on two nodes, and I'm sort of trimming the lines because it's quite a lot of lines here. If I'm running on two nodes, so you can see there's two different NIDs that the process is on. And you can see that um, from even from our trim down, but you can see that 0 to 23, the first 24 processes are running on the first node, and 24 to 48, so this was a two node job, I'm running on the next node. Okay? And similarly, you get the CPU mask. Um, Output chain where the processes are place, placed on particular nodes. Um, on, this is from Archer, so there are actually 48 entries because it includes the hyper threads. Okay, and this, so actually on Archer you find the first 24, the first 24 um, spaces are the hyper threads. So if you're not using hyper thread, it should always be zero. And then the one indicates um, which core you're on particularly. Um, in the thing. So you can see here there's five lines and they're using five different cores on that particular node. Okay. And you'll get this output for all the nodes. So it can be quite quite useful to actually check uh, the placement and check you're doing what you think you're doing to get the intents of the placement. Okay. Next thing was so I hardware cancers on Archer. So the performance analysis to his trade path. I use them on the performance of the hardware that I've got access to a space called Packy to hardware cancers. And after you've instrumented your code using the standard uh, setup described in the best practice guide, for example, um, and set up, if you add this environment variable to your job script, it enables um, a hardware cancer group. So there's a list of them if you do where uh, you can run a man page, I'll add a note to this slide um, before I put it on the website about how you access the man page. Listing all the different hardware cancer groups. 
we set this one to one, which is the default group. Um, that shows it's supposed to show a summary with floating points and cache metrics, right? And it's quite that's generally the one many people are interested in. There are also hardware counter groups for uh, uh, particularly focusing on memory. Um, you can also access hardware counters even on the um, early user chips to talk about at a very low level how they are dealing with communication. Uh, dealing with communication. And so if you set this, the type of outputs you'll get, I'm sorry this is probably a little small for people to see, but what you'll see is there are lines with lots of stuff in green with numbers on the end, and then there are some blue ones I picked out which I'm going to talk about on the next slide. Um, on Archer currently on these Intel processors, the uh, floating point hardware counters aren't as available as I understand it. And so disappointing you can't see the same as on the drum is on Hector, you'd be able to see um, what type of uh, floating point performance you're getting, what type of uh, vectorization you're seeing at the hardware level. At the moment on the Intel chips, this, on these Intel chips in particular, this doesn't seem to be available. But you can have a look at the um, memory usage and cache usage. So uh, the ones I've highlighted in blue there are the TLB, uh, the TLB utilization, uh, the level one cache, uh, hit miss ratio, and the um, one and two cache, the level one and two cache hit miss ratio. Right. So, oh, ah, I've forgotten something. I forgot to include the extra slide there. Sorry, I thought I had an extra slide describing exactly how they were used. Okay, so in terms of TLB utilization, I'll just speak, I'll uh, um, say here, and I'll add into the slide before on the website. In terms of TLB utilization, with a default page size and the dual precision floats, really there shouldn't be less than about 512 refs, 512 refs from this, right? So that, that means that every uh, double precision numbers used at least once from the buffer. Okay, so if you're seeing the numbers other than 512 and you haven't enabled huge pages um, or anything like that, then there's a sign that something is inefficient in the memory access in your code. In terms of the D1 cache hit miss ratio, again for double precision floats, a ratio of around a ratio of 87.5% corresponds to each double being used at least once. It's less than this, something uh, See, something's going wrong somewhere in the way your code is using the memory. Um, generally, it's for good performance you expect to see. And in this case, you can see that it's. Um, sorry, I can't read that. It's too far. 94.8%. Um, and for the T1 to cat hit miss ratio, really you're looking for this to be very high. It should be greater than 97% uh, if your code is performing reasonably in memory. Okay. So you can get, use these hardware games, it's very easy, very lightweight. This is from a sampling experiment rather than a tracing experiment. So it's quite, you can just add this into any sampling experiment and get um, some quick statistics on how your code is performing and how well it's using uh, the memory on the system. So, next one. Um, one of the other problems you come, we've come across is that when you're trying to debug a code, Okay. One of the things that um, the BLAS, the Craig BLAS does in the LibSci library um, is it also tunes for different problem sizes and for and at run time. So this can make it sometimes a bit challenging to try and debug problems, especially if they involve these routines or you're seeing some sort of um, vague numerical um, error that you want to try and tie it So is it happening in the BLAS? Is it something in my code that's affecting the, the core of the BLAS? Okay. One of the things you want, want to do here probably is turn off the auto tuning um, to make sure that it's not doing something other than you think onto the hood. Okay? And you can just do that by this um, useful um, environment variable to your script. I haven't been able to find I had to I mean I asked the create people for how to how to do this or how to do the oh they offered how to do this then I can't find it in the documentation. Anywhere. So this is a sort of, as far as I can tell, the moment an undocumented feature. Uh, but we'll add it into the best practice guide on the Archer website, so you should be able to search for it in there. And of course, it'll be available in these slides. But that would be a useful um, tip if you're um, involved in debugging some code and you're not quite sure what's going on. So remove another variable that you might have to think about. And finally, I'm going to the end now. 
So using ATP, the abnormal termination processing is quite useful. So quite often in the system you'll have something running down it or say fault or just crash. Um, you can switch this on and this system will automatically catch the crash for you and try to provide some extra information on the crash. And generally it's a, it's a no performance cost really to the code so you can have it turned on all the time and it should um, just work. You set in your job submission script um, ATP enabled equals one. Um, you don't need to recompile because ATP is enabled by default on the system when you compile you automatically get all this information into your code. And what ATP does is it catches um, dying applications and produces a merge stuff stack trace. What it actually does is three things when it crashes. One, it produces a stack trace of the first failing process because that might be the one that's implicated in causing the program to crash. Then it produces a visualization of every process's stack trace. So it tries to give a merged uh, stack trace that shows you what every um, process was doing at the time of the crash. And it generates a selection of relevant core files. So as you'll see in a minute, when you produce the merged stack trace, you generally find that processes are grouped into uh, different groups of processes that were doing particular things at the crash time. And it will try and produce a core file that represents each of these cases for you. So it's quite a simple way to start the debugging process, right? It's something you can automatically get um, for uh, very little effort on your part from the system. Um, and the, the view you get in using a stack of the merged backtrace, this is the thing that's supposed to indicate what all the processes are doing. You can see you start the gray box at the top of your program, and then there are these branches uh, which represents what each of the different classes of processes were doing at crash time. So there might be one that caused the crash to do one thing and everybody else has stopped and just got caused and the thing broke. Um, or there might be a few different paths that are going on at the moment. And this would be, like I say, it's quite an easy way um, to find out what was going on in the code when it crashed and um, sort of pump prime your legal being process. It gives you a clue um, before you even start using the debuggers like DB2 and things like that. So there's just a few um, quick sort of technical tricks picked up in the first month or so of our show, the first time and the first few weeks we've had to um, play around with codes on it and to start debugging problems. Um, and I hope you found them useful as we can. So at the end of my presentation, so what I'd like to do now is give just anybody the chance to ask any questions. You can um, there should be a raised hand button if you just ask, ask them a question. If you've got your microphone enabled, you can um, do it by mic or you can do it by a chat. Um, does anybody have anything they want to ask or anything like that? Or any, I mean, it doesn't have to be about the presentation, just general uh, issues on Archer or anything like that, anything like or feedback you want to provide on Archer when things are running. I would be interested to hear that as well. Um, the other thing I'd say is that this is the first technical forum meeting. I mean, it's going to become a regular um, monthly event from now on. Uh, so, and hopefully with um, invited external speakers and things like that, experts in particular areas, uh, things. And um, so any information you have on how the um, online tool works for you, whether it has or hasn't worked, problems, things that work well, would be glad to hear that as well. You don't have to provide them actually here. If you have any comments, please just mail them to the help desk um, and we'll address them and use them to try and improve the service going forward. Okay, if I have nobody's got any questions or anything like that, I will waste anybody's time by uh, just saying it, saying it. What I would, my final comments are one, that if you have any technical tips or tricks of your own, please share them via the mailing list uh, because they're useful to everybody, whether they're um, service staff or uh, general users. And um, yes, I just have curiosity with 
because the chair mentioned the technical forum members but not being have access to the archer wiki. Um, no. So there isn't uh, sorry, the, the question about the archer wiki. There, there is an archer wiki, but at the moment it's a uh, service staff only wiki. It's for right. internal management of the uh, arch service, not for the general uh, public consumption at the moment. Did you mention, sorry, you did mention that the emails were being back with the So the, um, just the uh, email list is hosted by GISC, and we provide a lot of the UK um, educational lists, and they have a website that essentially has a provides a web interface to the list. You can post all that sort of stuff and share files and things like that, but it also has an archive, an archive of all previous posts, and so it's searchable. Uh, it's publicly searchable in the case of this list. I should say that but anything that goes to the uh, Archer Technical Forum list is public domain information. So when you're posting, you you say maybe some people may need to bear that in mind. So uh, the links on the community page. Uh, yeah, the links on the community page. So anyway, okay then. Thank you everybody for coming on. Um, I'll close this meeting. Uh, now I hope to see you in the next one soon. I'll advertise, we'll advertise it as soon as we have set the date and got the regular schedule in place. Uh, thank you for helping us test out the process. Um, and like to say any comments are much appreciated. Okay, bye bye everyone. Bye.